Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. An award-winning author and distinguished professor in Hunter College's English department, Elizabeth Nunez brings us wonderful stories about the people and islands in the Caribbean. And in her new novel, Even in Paradise, Shakespeare's King Lear provides the outline, but she, in her beautiful prose, adds the components of race, class, and privilege on the lush islands of Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica. And she's my guest today. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Ronnie. It's, it's so nice to uh, really have you back again and to read yes. this book, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> now, Shakespeare plays an important part in your framing and your novels, and, and I may be... Probably in know, my life. Yeah, I was going to say... In my life, anyway. yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I grew up in a colonial country um, colonized by the British, and we didn't have any other books. And so we read Shakespeare not as this scholarly um, writer right. in, in this way. We read him for his plots and the intrigue. Oh, how wonderful. Because, yeah. you know, here, I mean, I am so ignorant, I hate to say, about Shakespeare. I don't know how I went through so much education without being comfortable with him. But you're so comfortable, right? Yeah, I think yeah. teachers make people uncomfortable yeah. because Shakespeare didn't go to university. He didn't go to college. His father was a glove maker. What he did was read, which is what we tell our students to do. Yeah. And a lot of his stories, including the one that we're going, that's based on my, my that my novel is based, based on, on uh, King Lear, um, it was not original. He read that story in Holland Shedd's Chronicles about the um, English history, and he read about a King Lear who lived 800 years BC, and he said, well, that's a nice story. I'm going to write a play based on that story. Um, so, you know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. So when you start to write a book, mm -hmm. where does it all come together? I mean, how does it come together? Well, I, I, probably I will talk specifically about this book. Okay. Um, part of it has to do with something in my life, something that um, I haven't quite worked out or that I'm concerned about. Um, in this case, you know, the, the King Lear is about an a, a aging king who makes the mistake of, while he's alive, giving away his power and his property to his three daughters based on who says that they love him most. And when the youngest one doesn't give him the answer he wants, he disinherits her. Well, how does that clash with my story? Um, my parents died one really after the other, seven months apart. Mm -hmm. And I come from a family with five brothers and five sisters. And when my father's will was read, he did not leave us equal amounts. Oh. So there was some difference between who got more and who got less, and et cetera, et cetera. Needless to say, I got less. <laughs> oh. Um, is that because you left the island? That is because people have the notion that when you come to America, you are in the land of milk and honey, and therefore you don't need as much. You have but it, you know, it, the money was not the concern. The concern is that this parceling of the property or what he had equaled how much he loved which one the most. And I think that that is, to me, very much what Shakespeare was dealing with in his um, play, and it coincided. And of course, the big thing uh, w was that uh, this year, um, 2016, is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. He lived 1564 to 1616. So it was, an, uh, it was a wonderful combination of things. Um, That's so interesting. So your familiarity, you could see it in your life. It's, yeah. Did, did, does, did your father, you don't think your father, though, parceled out the money? Based on who he loved. On love, with. yeah. Um, I hope not. <laughs> uh, it's been about seven or eight years since he died. And I can tell you that at the beginning, it was very hard to reconcile with sisters where we were extremely close together, very tight knit. And that created a, a, a break. We are back again. But it took some doing. But I remember a, a situation where one of my sisters, who was at that time maybe 52, and another sister who was 54, well, the one who was 52 had become Minister of Finance 
And mm. so my father is in his 80s, let's say 85 or so. And over the breakfast table, he had a picture of the one who was Minister of Finance. And the, uh, when I came to Trinidad, the other one says, let's take that down. Let's take that down. <laughs> Do you see how daddy he thinks he's only looking at her all the time? <laughs> and she finally got me to take it down. And we said, OK, we put it by the bathroom door. But that wasn't good enough for her. We had to tear it up. Oh. So you put those things together um, and I begin so to see that it never stops. Yeah. That you that children want to be loved 100 yeah. percent by their parents. Yes. And a mistake a parent can make is to show that they love one child more than the other. And I think this was Leah's mistake. That's so interesting. Did the men do as well as the women in, in, in the will? <laughs> I'm just so curious. I can't. It's not really. <laughs> Someone, yeah. Um, he, he knew which one of my brothers probably needed it the most, yeah. and he gave him yeah. the most. Yeah. Do you teach creative writing? I do. I teach, um, and I have to tell you, Ronnie, that I um, been, my education has been in literature. Um, it is no accident that my dissertation many, many moons ago was on a, one of Shakespeare's plays, The Tempest. And I actually wrote a modern day version on uh, that, yeah. Prospero's Daughter. So I, I, I sort of preferred teaching literature, but uh, when I came to Hunter uh, approximately six years ago, the, the, the chair wanted me to, mm -hmm. to teach creative writing. And I came there struggling, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. resisting a bit, but now I love it. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Go on, I'm sorry. Say. Probably my resistance was, you know, that you have a group of students who are looking at you and thinking, you're going to show me how to write a best-selling novel. I'm going to do that. And the fact is that it's hard work. Do they have to read a lot also? Yes. Um, this semester, for example, I'm, I'm teaching it, I'm, I'll be coming to the end of the semester, they had to read a, my four novels. And for each of the novels, um, I'm not asking them to analyze it uh, as literary criticism. I'm asking them to look at the technique that the writer used. I'll give, them, give you an example. I had them read Great Gatsby. And what I want them to look at is not so much the story, it's the point of view, how Gatsby uses that first person who's mm -hmm. both an observer and a character. And do they have to write the way you did, uh, something in the same kind of framework? Then they have three stories that they have to write. Um, and when they write each story that they write, I edit. The, then the class edits, um, talk, you know, talks mm -hmm. about it. And then they have one week to revise it. So mm -hmm. each story is mm -hmm. edited by me, workshopped by the students, revised by them, and then corrected again by me. Sounds like a wonderful class. Yeah. Do you, when you write a novel, do they participate afterwards? Do they comment on it? They are <laughs> doing it on this novel. They are. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have their responses at home. And oh. I, after I leave the show, I'll be reading it. <laughs> what I always love about the books are the insights into life on these islands. Yeah. Because some of us go to the islands, but we don't get underneath it all. Do you know yeah. It? yeah. Uh, actually, it was a comment one of my students made, um, which was very strange because this student is uh, Latino, Hispanic, um, but lived here, um, grew up in, probably didn't grow up in Puerto Rico, but he has Puerto Rican mm -hmm. back, background. And he said how surprised he was to see that view of the Caribbean because people's notions come either a place where you go for vacation, blue sea and white sand, or their notions are people who they see working in, uh, working in, in various areas where Americans don't want to do it. <laughs> um, so they have a, 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 a skewed notion. They don't realize that we are just like any other society. Um, we have the working class, the middle class, the um, professional class. Who do you think are our doctors? We are. Mm. Who, who do you think are the lawyers? Trinidadians are the lawyers. Who are the accountants? Trinidadians are the accountants. So we don't import these professionals. Right. We, we have, have their own structure. And, and, um, and I like to tell stories. I like to base my stories in the real life of the Caribbean that people know. Um, there's so many different backgrounds of the Trinidadians. I mean, where they came from. Yes. I mean, where, you know, how? Yeah. They, I, go, mm -hmm. Tell me. I was, I, I, 
went out of my way to make sure that that happened in yeah. my novel. That was so revealing. I thought yeah. I liked it mm -hmm. a lot. Because a lot of people, their notion of people from Trinidad is what they see on um, Eastern Parkway for the, the carnival at Eastern Parkway. And they, they associate um, Trinidadians being Afro-Caribbeans. But the fact is there are as many Afro-Trinidadians as there are Indo-Trinidadians. In fact, there's a chance that there may be more Indian Trinidadians than there are Afro-Trinidadians. What happened? Um, we had um, emancipation in 1834. And when emancipation came, of course, if you were working on the plantation, the first thing you want to do is get off the plantation. But in the meantime, the British needed people to work on the sugarcane and the cocoa. So they um, brought in Indians and Chinese too. So, so I, I have Indian characters in my novel. I have a Chinese character in my novel. The Indians continued to work on the plantations. The Chinese couldn't handle the heat, so they became shopkeepers. And then, as you see, I have a, a Lebanese character. Um, and that wasn't difficult to do because my sister was married to a Lebanese Caribbean uh, person. That's so interesting. Yeah. And, and then you have the remaining and, yeah. English. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, when yeah. you see um, people of um, British background who are Caribbean, absolutely. I, I think I mentioned Peter Minchel um, in the novel. He is, he no longer does it, but he gave the, he did the best carnivals in Trinidad, the best carnival costumes, and this is an English yeah. Caribbean person. They did the audio book for this novel, and they, the people who did it called me up and were asking me about the British accent. I said, they are <laughs> of British heritage, but yeah. they are Caribbean people. They speak the way I speak. Yeah. You know? it's an, and very delightfully, too. It well, has this lovely, I mean, does, the, the, the speech has this just lovely tone to it. Does that pervade into... Well, it depends mean? on yeah. what your... Um, I see, you can tell by the class. You can tell. Uh -huh. and you can tell in terms of schools and so on. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, more so in, well, in all the islands, but in the islands that I have, Barbados and Jamaica, there would be Jamaicans speaking and I would have no clue of what they're saying. Or Barbadian speaking, mm -hmm. and I would. So mm -hmm. it's it depends on. Each your, has yeah. its own but, it, but they all have a. I think we all have a kind of a lilt. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. So, within this mixture, there is still discrimination between one group and another. Yeah, or preference, or what is it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we like to say in the Caribbean that it's about class, and we like to say that regardless of the color of your skin. If you are a doctor, you are given the same um, respect and privilege as if you were a white doctor. Uh, we like to see that. And that's vividly explained in the novel. Yes, we like to see that. And it's difficult to, to really work it out because you do see that. You would come to the Caribbean and you would say, what a multicultural place this is, you know? Um, uh, you would go to an event and you'll see people of all different sorts of cultural backgrounds working together, but they tend to be of the same social class. Um, I remember sending my son when he was 16 to Trinidad, and he said to me, Mom, every party I go to, whether it's in the South, the East, the West, or the North, I meet the same people. So interesting. And I said to my son, that's what class is. Is that the same in Barbados? In oh, Georgia? absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Probably more so in Barbados. Uh, uh, but what you find out is that the darker the color, the more that it is likely that person is in the working class. And so you can't get away from the fact that skin color does, in fact, color how... Um, a major Jamaican writer who happens to be white, Michelle um, Cliff, refers to what we have in the Caribbean as colorism. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, that's what she says. So it's, it, in a way, it's similar to here because the white is equal to the lighter color. Yeah, but you know, Ronnie, Terrible. I think the <laughs> distinction I would make is that no one questions the humanity. And that I find hard to take in America. When one questions 
one's humanity based on your skin color. One, when one decides, one questions whether based on your color, you have a certain level of intelligence. Based on your color, maybe your values are different. Based on your color, maybe your morality is different. We don't have that in the Caribbean. There is no question about your, the, your basic humanity. There may be questions about what part of the pie you will get. Will you what get do you, more? When you say humanity, what do you mean? I mean that um, the possibilities open to me as a human being and the values I have as a human being have nothing, are not judged by my color in the Caribbean. Here, and this is, doesn't, may not sound right, but um, we were having a department meeting and one of the faculty said, um, a white faculty, male, both were important, male and white, mm -hmm. said, um, you know, it doesn't matter, I don't put PhD next to my name because, you know, I don't need to show off that way. And I'm dying to tell him that when I taught at Medgar Evers, yeah, I didn't need to. But when I taught at, at Hunter, yes, I did. I, uh, because the first thing that happens is what the students see is a black female in their class. And that goes along with all the associations that they make with what I am capable of as a human being. So I have to convince them that not only I am their teacher, but I have written 10 books at this point, and I have a PhD. And Look at me, I'm, I am right. Yeah, and I've written many scholarly articles. So that's the difference I would say. What's interesting is that you're comfortable at Medgar Ever because women normally, I mean, you know, we always say we have to talk louder. Mm -hmm. We have to be better prepared. You know, Bella Abzug had to wear the hat mm -hmm. in Congress or when she was a lawyer so people wouldn't think she was going to get the yeah. coffee. I mean, it's, it's interesting yeah, that, that you're in correct. your own company. No, no, at Matt Gavis, I don't. No, I'm saying that you didn't feel the need. That's right. Yeah. But, but Is that but, because the, the world was of no, so much color? No, I, I want to bring it back to the difference that you were asking me mm -hmm. about um, race mm -hmm. and class in the Caribbean and here in the United States. And I have come to this conclusion that, the base, that we do have the whole problem of shades of cut, shades of skin and so on and so on, and definitions of beauty. But I think the essential difference is that once humanity is questioned in, in the United States based on your color. So based on the shade of your skin, you are immediately, your humanity in terms of what you're capable of doing. I I'm see. going to cross the street if I see you because I think people who have that shade of skin are more mm -hmm. prone to crime. Mm -hmm. I am going to question whether you have the, the intelligence when you come to my classroom. That piece does not happen in the Caribbean. One does not, you are not, your basic humanity is, is, is not, is, is is not, not what, a device uh, dividing. It, yeah. it may be economic. Yeah. It may be in terms of what, whether you're beautiful or you're not beautiful. Yeah. Um, but it is not that you are not capable, that you, are, that you, that you can't, I, I don't know how to explain this, mm -hmm. except to say, I feel that, I mean, I was just in Trinidad in, um, in December for the holidays, and I felt it so absolutely. People didn't know me. I can walk around mm -hmm. the savannah in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. I can walk on the beach. They don't know I'm a professor or a writer, but there is a difference. In, in it's something, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's not it just that it's poorly for this country. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I think we are on our way. But um, just recently, my son told me a joke that he was in a party with more white guys sitting around talking and, and, and they made a joke to him that they all laughed at. I'm not going to repeat the yeah. joke. And that was at the center of that joke yeah and they were all of the same social class yeah that wouldn't happen yeah. in the caribbean they were all of the same social class the only difference there was my son was black yeah. and they made the joke um and he he, he was so offended yeah. by it that he he came you know he came over and he he said yeah. to me he says mom what do you think of that so it you know it's just mm -hmm. i know what you mean it, it, yeah 
it's and and of course now we we are here in um, <laughs> oh, wow. twenty sixteen and it's raising its ugly head. It is. It's amazing, isn't mm -hmm. it? In uh, is education readily available yes. to everybody? Yeah. Well, I will confess that I am not. <laughs> I am not a, a Bernie Sanders uh, supporter. Right. However, I do absolutely agree with him that education should be free. Now, as much as you may want to call Trinidad a third world country, education is free from cradle to grave, which means elementary school, which means nursery school, which means college, which means university. You don't pay. Um, so your only problem is can you afford to go to live? Not the affording isn't the tuition or the cost of education. It's the ability to yeah. are you, have are you studying your lessons? Yeah, right. are, you, are, you, yeah. are you studying? As yeah. so long as you're studying and you can yeah. pass, you can... You Why can do you live. refer to it as a third world nation? No, I, I, I was just putting you didn't that. Mean it. You were I'm just putting being, air quotes in it. All right, because, I hope so. <laughs> no, I was, putting, I, was, I was putting it like that's how it's, it's yeah. perceived, but yeah. Trinidad in no way is. We have oil um, tr in Trinidad. Tr right. Well, oil isn't <laughs> going down the drain right now, <laughs> um, but uh, Trinidad is... Yeah. is it's not a, one of the islands that depends on tourism. Mm. It may have to. So let's talk a little about the book. Yes. Because you touch all the bases, but the major thing is really love. Is that really well, parental love? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the difference. Um, Jane Smiley, of course, mm -hmm. uh, wrote a book called A Thousand Acres, mm -hmm. and I should be so lucky to get yeah. all the <laughs> right. awards she got for it, including a movie. And she, it seems to me, was concerned about the same thing. Why were the two older daughters of the Lear equivalent such wicked people? And she came to the conclusion that the father had sexually ab uh, abused the eldest daughter and the middle daughter, but the middle daughter had blocked it out. So I'm kind of, in my novel, I'm working with the same thing. Why were those two girls so um, wicked? I came to a different conclusion, and my conclusion is that those two girls were so wicked because their father had made very clear that he preferred his youngest daughter. And so um, I actually have a little quote from Shakespeare where yeah. he says, um, where the eldest daughter says to the middle daughter, he always loved our sister most. And with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. And that's in Act One, Scene yeah. One. So to me, my novel works on a father who, who shows a preference to his youngest daughter. And then the, what do the two older daughters, that kind of resentment, is that possible? Yeah. And then the younger daughter, though, is so honest. Yes. Right? In both the Shakespeare's play and in my yeah. novel. And realistic. Yeah in, yeah, in both Shakespeare's play, because the question is that when the father says, who do you love the most? The eldest daughter says, I love you more than the sun and the moon and the stars. And the middle daughter says, well, I love you more than the sun and, and the whole world. I love you more than life itself. The eldest daughter, you know, comes <laughs> yeah. back. And when he turns to the youngest daughter and he says, well, come on, you know, you are my joy, the apple of my eye. Tell me how much you love me. And she says, um, well, my two sisters have husbands. And when I have a husband, I'll have to share my love with my husband. So the father says, well, how much? She says, half. Uh -huh. And he goes, berserk. So for me, the question in Lear is, Shakespeare's Lear is, why does he go berserk? When that's a reasonable answer. Mm -hmm. uh, not only is it a reasonable answer, it is an ans answer that is supported by the Bible. Mm -hmm. You leave your family and you go with your husband. Why does he go? So I think in A Thousand Acres, um, Jane Smiley's response is, he goes berserk and the sisters go crazy because he had sexually abused them. And I feel that he goes berserk because that's the daughter he loves the most. And he didn't expect her to say half. Yeah. He expected her to say even more than the other two sisters. Right. And, and the two sisters, when they get together, the two older ones get together, that quote I just read, you know, they so, have to do everything to, well, to try to, what? Well, they, 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 
they're, they're, they're terrible to the youngest sister. They resent it. They resent all um, oh, the love yeah. she's got. And, and their resentment takes, in my novel, their resentment takes the shape of trying to get everything. They mm -hmm. want everything. They want her to be disinherited. They want to get the house. Um, because, of course, a lot, the, lot of the novel, the paradise here in the novel is Barbados. Mm -hmm. And the father has this big house with two promontories on either side. And the two older sisters says, well, this big house facing the beach would make a nice restaurant. And then we could have a, um, a condo on the side. <laughs> but the father has left the big house for the, right. the younger yeah. sister. Yeah. And in the meantime, you also discuss race. Very much so. And even the relationship between Lebanese. Yeah. And that surprised me. And, and that sometimes happens when you put a novel in a certain setting and you have these characters. You know, I had a yeah. Lebanese. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to show how multicultural Trinidad is. But once I did that, I was now in what's going on right now. Right. Um, with, with the Iraq war, the right. consequence of that. Right. And attitudes towards people, um, it, that it spreads even to the Caribbean, attitudes towards people who have the Muslim faith or mm -hmm. people who come from that part of the mm -hmm. world. So that ties up. Right. And then we have race. <laughs> yeah. Just that. And you even touch poverty and the fear of it. Yes. And then, I you that know. That was really interesting, Tivoli Gardens and yeah. Jim well, for each, for each of the countries that I went to, the islands, I mean, in Barbados, the, the, the big prob, the big, Barbados makes its money on tourism. And if you go to Barbados, especially what's called the Gold Coast, the going up to the north, mm -hmm. I don't know my right from my left, but the going up the northeast, co west coast of Barbados, you see these big mansions. Um, Tiger Woods mm -hmm. had his, 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 um, first, his wedding there. But the point is that all beaches are public beaches. How do they get those beaches to be spread out with all those um, right. umbrellas yes. and whatever? How do you well, get there? The law says they must have an access pass. But if you drive down the road, you can barely see that access pass. That's a universal problem. It is a universal it's problem. Calif all over. Yes. yes. Now, in, in Jamaica, the problem is different. It's the problem of drugs, particularly in Tivoli. Tivoli yeah. Gardens, and I focused on a notorious um, drug lord, Duda Skok, and what was... It was like Robin Hood. <laughs> that he is yeah. a kind of a Robin Hood, yeah. that is correct. And, yeah. and, and what I found out is that 72 people died to protect him so amazing. from the law. Mm -hmm. Well, all I can say, we've come to the end. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is such a, but I think we've shown the richness of this novel. And Thank I you. I hope that Thank people you, will read it. And we're looking forward to your next one. Thank you. <laughs> you already starting? You're thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Elizabeth Nunes. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.